I remember him thrusting three or four times. I remember going on the floor, crunching up in the, like a fetal position, mm -hmm. screaming, help, help me, help me. I thought I was going to die. Mm. I remember saying to a nurse, please don't let me die. When it happened, was there any pain or anything? Cool, the pain was unbearable. Because when you see films and they talk you, to the ambulance will be here soon and they keep you talking, mm. it does work. Mm. It does, because all I wanted to do is sleep. I don't want to sound like I'm going mad, but... Talk your talk, this is you street know. mic, talk your talk. When I asked the doctor, I said, I'm not going mad, can you explain? I saw black. And the doctor said that comes with loss of blood. And it's like I was part of my transitional journey. I was on my way to heaven. How long was you in hospital for, Randy? Three and a half months. You told me previously that you died twice. Yeah. In the operating theatre, they told me you, you get flashbacks of the incident. Mm. I remember crying a lot. Mm -hmm. And I don't like crying. Mm -hmm. And the doctors visited me a couple of times. They weren't being patronised or condescending. But they said, they commented that I shouldn't be here today. Mm. They said you fought mentally and physically on that operating theatre. And you wanted to live? I wanted to live. Has the perpetrators against you, have they been apprehended? Do you have any recommendations for the Mayor of London? Knife crime is dangerously out of control with numerous people being murdered on the streets of London by those who carry a knife. Street Mike podcast goes onto the same streets to meet interesting people, to have an engaging conversation with them about any topic. In this episode, we have secured an exclusive interview with a hero who was a victim of knife crime. The person miraculously survived the horrific attack and they have decided to tell Street Mike Podcast their personal story to help others. The person will also be making recommendations to the Mayor of London on what needs to be done to reduce the levels of knife crime in the capital. Please contact Wendell Daniel if you have an idea for future episode. I'm now on Twitter at Street Mike Pod or on Instagram at Street Mike Podcasts or you can send me an email at streetmikepodcast at gmail.com. Please remember to subscribe to this podcast and you will be sure to receive any more interesting conversations from the streets of London. It is recommended that you should switch off now if you will be offended by the graphic details in this podcast. Before we go into those nightmares, flashbacks, feeling unsafe. Tell me a little bit more about Andrew. My parents, my father was um, Guyanese, mm -hmm. mother Barbados. Mm -hmm. So I'm a Bajan like me? Yes, my father. Aye, <laughs> see, we're the best, man, we're the best. <laughs> <laughs> Only joking, yeah, go on. So my stepmother's Grenadian, uh -huh. and um, I looked at my mother, stepmother, as more as my mother, mm -hmm. she took. Um, she met my father when we was eight. Mm -hmm. So, if then from then I was mentally scarred, I'd say. Was Was you born in the West Indies, or was you born here in England? I was born here in England. All right Highbury, then, Highbury. Oh. So, so you grew up in Highbury. Would, do you mind me asking, how old are you? You don't have to answer that question if you 56. don't want to. You're, you're what? 56. Oh my God, you look, you look 26. <laughs> You're being kind. Uh, no, you, no, 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 you, you, you look good for your age, man. Yeah, considering my lifestyle, considering what I've been through. What I want to go into now is specifically what happened 
to you recently and then we can move backwards from that. So in London, as you know, there is a unacceptable wave of knife crime with so many people being stabbed and killed. Of course. Only a few days ago, just down the road in Camden Town, there was a victim in Camden High Street. There was also two other victims, one was with a gun and one was with a knife in Camden Town, Kentish Town. So there's a wave of killings that's going on throughout the country, but specifically in London, it's out of control. So can you tell me what happened with yourself when you were stabbed? I witnessed... Um, How long ago was this? A year ago, just over a year. So what month? July. So it was July. July? Yeah. So I, 14 months ago? Yeah, I witnessed a bungled attempted robbery on a middle-aged lady. What do you mean by you witnessed a bungled it robbery? Was, um, they didn't succeed, it, you know, due to my intervention. What? De describe what form that robbery took. Is that going too close? No, 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 no. No, no. It's... So you were walking... Do you yeah. want to mention where it was? You don't have to... No, Golders Green. So you was in Golders Green? Yeah, and... Um, minding your own business? Yes, yeah, just a lovely sun, Sunday afternoon. Uh -huh. Where there was nice and cool, you know, just right. Uh -huh. And I um, didn't have a lot of money on me. Mm -hmm. but I, was, I was okay, I've eaten, you know, had a bit, about 30 pounds on me. So I was okay for the day. And when I witnessed the moped go up on the pavement, I'm attempting to grab her handbag and her instant reaction was she didn't let go. So um, they, they dragged her. Seeing a woman being dragged is um, not a pleasant sight. Straight away that brought memories, a youngster, of my parents' relationship. Because mm -hmm. there was a lot of arguing and shouting before they separated, you know? Mm -hmm. As you can see in the beginning, I didn't mention that. But yeah, yeah. I'll, in I'll infer it now. And it just... It brought memories. Anyway, I stood there, gave the lady back the handbag. Let's get this clear. You were in Golders Green last July on a beautiful Sunday afternoon. <laughs> you witnessed a moped mm. mount the pavement and someone on that moped grabbed the bag of a lady and the lady, and the lady wouldn't let go and... Was, was it that the bag was, she let go of the bag and it dropped, or what happened? The bag, she let go, the bag didn't drop, she let go, or it snapped, or I pulled, I can't remember. Uh -huh. But my grip pulled it. And so, so when you saw it happening, I just, I just want to get it mm -hmm. right. So when you saw it happening, how close were you to the lady when, it, when the incident began? 50 yards. So you were 50 yards. So, so when you saw, does that mean you then went towards what was happening yes. with a view yes. of intervention. Yes, mm -hmm. In instant reaction it was. Um, 20 minutes later, they came back. Black bastard. Didn't think nothing of it, because mm -hmm. heard it all before. And I remember him thrusting three or four times, but I thought it was just a, a gesture of uh, pointing. It wasn't until a few members of the public shouted at me as if it was an armed police. Literally, mm. it always reminds me as if it was armed police. Get down on the floor, get down on the floor. I was stabbed in the bowel, so I had a little bit of my stomach. Away. So, you witness the incident occurred. Mm -hmm. The lady fell on the floor. Mm, being dragged. Being dragged. Yeah. You intervened. Mm. The, the moped person drove off. 
you then saw the lady was okay, etc. Had a conversation with the lady, I'm assuming. You then went about your business. Mm -hmm. And as you, as you were walking along Golders Green High Street, High Road, you heard someone shout, Black Bastard. Yeah. And then... I thought, you're not getting away with this. But it could have got me into trouble because her instant reaction was I was involved. Yeah, yeah. And as I was walking back to get to her, So after people said to you, get down, get down the floor, get down the floor, what then happened? My stomach was hanging out because I was stabbed in the bowel three or four times. So they stabbed you in the stomach three or four times? I'll give you a few moments, yeah? And then girls didn't. One of the things that um, I thought I was going to die. Mm. But did you, when it happened, was there any pain or anything? Cool, the pain was unbearable. And I didn't feel it in the. Initially? Initially. But obviously, when people said, saw my part of my intestines hanging out, or if that's the right. Term. I remember going on the floor, crunching up in the, like a fetal position, mm -hmm. screaming, help, help me, help me. And I just wanted to sleep, just wanted to sleep. And obviously there's a crowd built up then, about 10, 15 people. And all I can hear them saying is, Andy, open your eyes, open your eyes. So they knew your name? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. of my lifestyle. Because of your lifestyle, people in Gold is Green will be a bit familiar, familiar with familiar. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they were saying, open your eyes. So they didn't want me to go to go. Because when you see films and they talk you, so the ambulance will be here soon and they keep you talking, mm. it does work. Mm. It does. Because all I wanted to do is sleep and I looked up because I was on the floor and the sky looked very dark black I thought I was in hell mm. and I remember waking up after the operation I told the doctor my experience so when it happened you was on the floor, mm, screaming, crun screaming, crunched up in a fetal position. Ambulance didn't come for 26 minutes. Ambulance didn't come for 26 minutes. And, and at this time, I'm assuming you're losing blood. Four litres. You lost four litres of blood. I'm assuming, even though it's hot, it was probably getting cold. Yes, yes. And when I said to the doctor, I'm not going mad, I saw the skylight. What do you mean by you saw skylights? You, when I asked the doctor, I said, I'm not going mad, can you explain? I saw black. And the doctor said that comes with loss of blood. And it's like I was part of my transitional journey. I was on my way to heaven. It's like I was floating. Mm. It's like I was going to heaven. And people stopping me midway, not letting me reach the destination. It's weird. People take their coats off, whatever, trying to stem the bleeding. And it was all I remember getting to the hospital, the nurse shouting in my ears, Andy, you're very, very, very sick. You know, I remember saying that in my ear, you are very, very, very. How long was you in hospital for, Andy? Three and a half months. Three and a half months? Yeah. And, and during that time... No, sorry, two and a half months. Two and a half months. And, yeah. and I'm, I'm assuming during that time, there were a number of operations. That's an assumption. Yes, there was. Yes. I thought I was going to die. 
Mm. I remember saying to a nurse, please don't let me die. And she held my hand, a, a, a Vietnamese nurse. And she said, Andy, I shouldn't say this, but I promise you, you're not going to die. Because I had 24 hour care, you know, two nurses rotating yeah, 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 yeah. at my bedside because I had to wear a nappy. What was that, an intensive In care unit, yeah, yeah, right, whatever it's ICU called? ICU or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. Intensive yeah, yeah. care. Mm. I, was, um, I had to wear a nappy. I'm very lucky that I didn't have to end up wearing a stormer. Mm. I was millimeters away from that happening. Cause yeah. I, I was stabbed in the in the bowel. Mm -hmm. One of the worst places to be stabbed, the bowel. Mm -hmm. And um, is that because the bowel contains a lot of so bad stuff, which yeah. which will infect your body? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's it. That's it. Yeah. But early, but you told me previously that you died twice. Yeah. In the operating theatre, they told me, the doctors told me, they thought they must be. Thinking back, and, and you mentioned about you were going to heaven, does, does that mean you have faith? Yes, I do. Tell me about your faith, faith. and how that helped you on the day, I remember the going, recovery. I remember going to church as a kid, mm -hmm. every Sunday. What type of church? Church of England. All right then. And did you go there with your siblings? Yes, me and my brother. Mm -hmm. And even that wasn't... That, so I also lost my faith because the, 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 my other children that went, they were well-dressed, mm -hmm. had, you know, had their Sunday suit. Mm -hmm. Whereas me and my brother, we didn't have a suit. Mm -hmm. And you can see them whispering and talking. Mm -hmm. I think from that age it's made me vigilant, you know, to people talking. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, felt inferior from then, mm -hmm. felt different from then. Mm -hmm. And then, how to put it, put it how to put it. But I remember the pain was so much, I asked the doctor if I could sign a form to let me go. And the doctor said to me, I said, I'm of sound mind, but I can't take this pain because I was in the highest dosage of, not highest, but a very high dosage of morphine. And it didn't seem to be over me. So are you telling me you was telling the doctor whilst being in hospital mm -hmm. that you had capacity to be able to make decisions? In the early stages, I didn't talk. Uh -huh. But as time progressed, mm -hmm. They visited me, the doctors, mm -hmm. because I didn't have no one to visit me. Mm -hmm. Part of recovery, apart from it being very painful, you, you get flashbacks of the incident. Mm. I remember crying a lot. Mm -hmm. and I don't like crying. Mm -hmm. And the doctors visited me a couple of times. They weren't being patronised or condescending, but they said, they commented that I shouldn't be here today. Mm. They said you fought mentally and physically on that operating theatre. And you wanted to live? I wanted to live. How, after your first operation, how long before you knew what was going on and you was conscious and what had occurred? How long was, did it take? Or was it an immediate thing? I remember going in on a Sunday and I said, it's a, today Monday, they said, no, it's two weeks Thursday that I was put in an induced coma. So you was placed in an induced coma yes. for two and a half weeks? Yeah, no, two weeks. Two or, weeks. Or ten days. Yeah. Oh, wow. Mm. And that was to slow everything down yeah. and to aid recovery? Yeah. Um, the morphine just didn't seem to help. Mm. They gave me pressed button to release. It just didn't help. And then I'm wearing a nappy, pooing mm. myself. Mm. Felt embarrassed to ask the nurses to change me. Uh -huh. And they were very kind and very mm. helpful because and they taught me that mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're number two. 
mm -hmm. is very toxic and mm -hmm. in, in the skin it can eat the skin away oh wow so to press the bell and they'll change my nappy because mm -hmm. I was put my I had no control of down the yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I was um, sweating the bed about ten times a night mm -hmm. that nurse had to change me ten times mm -hmm. a night that I was highly highly embarrassed you know? after the incident occurred and after you had gained consciousness was there contact made with you by the police, for example, in regards to what had occurred? I remember not wanting to say anything because I come from a background of um, see no evil, hear no evil. Mm. But after speaking to various people, they said to me, they showed me that these guys weren't giving me a slap. They wanted to take me out. So I don't owe no loyalty to them. Because maybe I felt I did. Because I come from the ethics of um, don't say nothing. You know, it's seen as snitching. Mm. I have to ask you a pertinent question, and I hope you won't be offended. Mm. In not telling the police, is that not making the situation worse? Of course, but um, I was thinking of reprisal. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there but was a fear. There was a fear because you. I'm assuming because you was well known mm -hmm. in the local area. Yeah. People could maybe find out about yourself. Of course, of course. How difficult was that for you in considering these issues and not reporting it? How hard was that? Very hard. But then, it wasn't hard because they went to take away my life mm. and I needed to do something about it so they could won't end up taking somebody else's. Yeah, so you, so you did what was right? Yeah, because one thing, two things, when you get, as you get older, your moral stance changes. <laughs> as we know. <laughs> and um, it was right. Mm. You know. Has the perpetrators against you, have they been apprehended? Yes, they, they uh, were given subsequently six years, I, I believe. So they were caught yeah. and a sentence has been handed down? Oh, yes, yes, oh, yeah, yes. yes. How, how does that make you feel now? that justice has been, has been served against those who wounded you and nearly ended your life? Makes me feel good that the sentence, they won't harm nobody else. Yeah. But in the same time, the, the judicial system didn't, didn't treat me well because I was of no fixed address and obviously they were looking for me to give evidence in court mm -hmm. but, but I was led to believe I wouldn't be needed in court mm -hmm. and um, a warrant was issued for my arrest mm -hmm. and um, because I had no address I was uh, remanded in custody for a couple of nights one was scrubs mm -hmm. and I'm, I can remember shouting I'm the bloody victim here so, so hold on. So, what you're saying, because you were of no fixed abode at the time, mm -hmm. because you could not attend court yeah. to give evidence, mm -hmm. you were a warrant was issued for your arrest. You mm -hmm. were arrested. Mm -hmm. You were placed on the remand. Mm -hmm. Then what happened? To get out of it quick, although I gave a logical reason why um you didn't attend i didn't attend i still was advised so i wouldn't be on the mind for a long time plead guilty because the charge was contempt of court so you was charged with contempt in not attending yeah 
it can be deemed as quite yeah, yeah. serious, you know. Yeah, yeah. I hear you. I hear I didn't you. Know, you know. So I, hear you. I haven't got much love for the judicial system. Cause I remember shouting in the police station, "I'm the victim." You know, I've had a rough ride from. Um, How about um, criminal injury compensation, and then we can talk about your rehabilitation after the event and how it's affected you even now. So, what's happening with the criminal injuries? Is there... I'm waiting. You're waiting. It's so the application has been made? Yes. It's, it's pending. It's pending? Yeah. I um, don't know how much it's going to be for. Yeah, of course, of course. But, but at least the application has been made mm. and then the responsible authorities will make mm. a determination yeah. and eventually... Tell me about your rehabilitation and recovery after going through such a traumatic event. Has there been a lot of physiotherapy? Have you had to go and see counsellors? What, what's been the... I've been, I've been seeing counsellors. Oh, but it just makes me feel really sad when I finish that 45-minute session. How often do you do that? I was doing it once a week. Oh, fair enough. It's affected my me respir respiratory. Mm -hmm. So it's harder to breathe, or? Yes, because I had to, when they cut me open, I had to break my rib cage and mm -hmm. my lungs. and Plus, I've had pneumonia twice, so that scarred my lungs. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, had, I've been battered for over the year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm you're, happy to be here today. You're happy to be. I, I, I can see that, and I love you. You, you know that. But tell me something. Knowing you, and I've, I've been seeing you around the streets of London mm -hmm. for about two years now. Yeah. But since the incident, since I discovered about the incident, you have changed, and you have changed. You're still the friendly, loving, kind person, but I've noticed a change in you. I've been told that. In a, was it a good way, bad way? Maybe it's the trust with people isn't there like it used to be, but you're still the same friendly person. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would agree that. Because when people want to get really close, I shy away. Mm, mm. You know, and that probably, would, would, would that be correct that that goes back to how we started the interview originally? Yes. When you were talking about your parents and the damage that caused on you yeah. and the effect it had on you. Yeah. Tell me, just like I said to you, one thing I would like to ask you about is, do you have any recommendations for the Mayor of London in regards to what needs to be done in London to improve or to reduce the unacceptable levels of crime. What recommendations would you make? Stiff, stiffer sentences. Too many, softly, softly approach, the kids are laughing. Knives are easy to obtain, no matter what you do, you know. Knives are easy to obtain. They need to be stiffer sentences for carrying. What, carry. what do you mean by stiffer sentences? Put me on the bone. What are you looking for? If you are caught carrying a weapon, what kind of minimum term sentence three are you to referring five, to? Three to five just for carrying. You know, no community service. No, you know, instant. The word should, it should be known. If you get caught carrying a blade, you are doing three to five. Minimum. Min minimum. They need to be told that. So, so if you go along the scale, so carrying a minimum of three to five, how about actually using the knife? What is the, because you said with, with your situation, the perpetrators received a six-year sentence. Are you saying that for what happened to you, what is the minimum sentence that should be handed down to a perpetrator once convicted 
through the criminal justice system. What's the minimum sentence? Ten. Ten minimum? Minimum. Some real de deterrent sentences need to be instilled mm. because they're laughing at the legal system. Yeah. But why do you think it is, Andy, that so many people nowadays are carrying a weapon, a knife specifically? Why do you think that is? Insecurity, something to prove. They don't want to be the one pushing the daisies, as they say. So they're carrying it because they're insecure. Mm -hmm. I, I've often heard that a lot of people nowadays are carrying weapons because it's a fashion accessory. I mean, that contributes to it also. Yeah, I'd say so. Good, good afternoon, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. Let me call him. Excuse me. He's got to be shy. So you see, see, that's someone who knows Andrew. Just like I said previously, you're well known, and someone just gone past. He's just called you a BBC actor, <laughs> and he's gone past. I'm assuming with his partner, and we called him back, and he, and and he didn't return. But we're coming close to the end end of the mm -hmm. interview, and earlier on, you was talking about. Your mum, and and from what I can gather, that love, even though she left, mm -hmm. the love she had passed on you, mm -hmm. and from what I know of you, you're a very kind, loving, warm person, even though you've been through what you've been through, you've you've gone through broken family, you've been technically homeless for so many years. Yeah. And you are, you nearly died less than a, just over a year ago. But you're still very warm and friendly towards people. Why is that? It's just me. I love people. And what reaction do you normally get to, from people towards you, generally? Some could be very warm and loving, and some could be horrible. But the majority, what, how would you describe the majority? warm and loving. The general public, I'd say, can I say what area? Let's just say the general public, the general public. The general public, as a whole, have been my medication for, you know, for my mental health. Yeah. They've been my strength, you know, because I've been there for, with um, chemical dependency many years ago. And I know what addiction is. Mm. I don't want to be addicted to prescribed drugs. Mm. So I, 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 I fight this battle bipolar. With that medication, just mm. talking to people and mm. makes me, you know, it makes me feel okay. Mm. So, so how long have you been diagnosed with bipolar? Eight years. Mm. Seven, eight years. And how does, it, how does that affect you on a daily, weekly, monthly basis? Some days can be very manic. Mm -hmm. Some days can be very slow. You know, there's no balance for me. But saying that I've been on a the word. I've been on a good path for a year and a half. Mm. I haven't had no um, explosive behaviour, mm -hmm. you know. Hence why I like um, communicating with public. Hence why I did some voluntary work. You know? And another thing... See, that's a prop aircraft <laughs> going overhead. And that's evidence that we are on the streets of London. I think they believe you, sir. <laughs> I think they believe you, Andrew. Do you think that's your fans flying overhead <laughs> to actually wave and say, say, there is Andrew, he's been just like your friend just now, said it's the <coughs> BBC. You've got your fans flying overhead. No, 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 no. I'm not that famous yet. Yet. <laughs>
<laughs> so, so you was gonna say, Andrew? Um, recently, I've been praying a lot, and I, I say to um, God, forgive me because I used him in vain. But I've been praying to tell him thank you for letting me live, to enjoy this life. And it's a pity that um, not many young people, especially, you know, in particular, black young people, if that's, I'm allowed to say that. You can say what you like, mate. Don't realize that life is so sweet and precious. I'm not preaching, but life is sweet, mm. you know? Experiencing what you've experienced, does that make you realize even more in relations to how precious life is because you was that close. Yes. You described to me about that feeling, the blackness, yes. and how you was being called to heaven, but you didn't want to go yet. Didn't want to go. Not yet, but part of me did want to, and part of me didn't. But the, 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 the transitional pe transition felt so lovely. You know, you're just floating. You know, like a teleport, but I ran out of fuel. Describe that transition to me and to my listeners, because one day each and every one of us will be called. You were called and you went through that transitional period. Describe that to me. Describe that to the listeners throughout the world, because we've heard of this. Very few people have actually experienced the near death and you're describing it as transitional it's dark your box is made you're floating and you're just reaching up to the sky and you're floating lay you know like you're laying out laid out and it's, the sky is black but you don't reach the destination But we've heard about angels. When you were floating, going towards this destination, what were you seeing? Just like a, I don't want to sound like I'm going mad, but. Talk your talk, this is street know, mic, talk your talk. You know, it's like a rainbow of light, you know, like glittering and you just, you want to reach and reach that, you know. But you just literally stopped and floating, laying back. And the doctor said, that's where you've lost of blood. You're on your way out. You know, mm, you know, mm. my description is, the doctor said, quite accurate, please. Loss of blood, you're on your way out. Like mm. a car running out of petrol. Mm. <laughs> slowly, 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 Slow, you're getting there. Slowly, yeah. But I didn't reach there. Mm. You know, thank, thank God. So, you, so, would it be correct that since this has occurred, your faith, your belief has been re... Installed. Re, in, re... Say that again. Re... Installed. Reinstalled. Yeah, is that, is that such a word? Or reinstilled or reinvigorated or I think re renewed. I we can think, use many words. I, put, I, I like to say renaissance. The renaissance. You see what I mean, Andrew, about you've got an excellent <laughs> command of the English language. Now you're talking about the renaissance. Yeah, the rebirth. The rebirth. Yeah. So, so, but have you, since this has occurred to you in July 2018, have you been to church or have you just said your prayers privately? Both, both. I've been to church and I do say my All prayers right then. privately. What was that like, tell me, when you went to church? What was it like? Harrowing. Describe, describe it to me. I felt I was going into a special invitation well, God's house. So it felt truly yeah. like God's house yeah, yeah, after this occurred to you. Yeah, and you owe me one, son. Uh, you, know, uh, you, know, like, you know, come in. You know, that's my quirk yeah, to it, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's up to you. Surrender and live a better life. You, you know, 
because you ain't been living a fruitful life, Andy. Mm. But I gave you a chance. That's how I tele transcribed it in my head. Yeah. So, so from what you're saying, you was given a second chance. Mm. But how has life changed for you? I can see you're a different person, mm. but specifically, in your outlook, daily activities, in what you want to do for the future, how has that changed? I've got patience, much more patience. I've become very, I've practiced humility, understanding. I try to be less judgmental. And I think most, in, most of all I gain some lovely perception skills, mm. you know. Does that mean you are now seeing the world in a, or seeing your environment, the people around you, in a completely different way than before? I don't know, Wendell. All I know is, I wish my life would improve mm. vastly, but it mm. doesn't come that quick. Mm. And I put it down to that in my head. I say I've surrendered, but I don't think I've totally surrendered properly. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and in this, in this, um, I don't know what the word is, but the, the situation, in environment. This, yeah, in this situation, it's all or nothing. Mm. God wants all or nothing, mm. and I haven't given all. Mm. So I haven't given all, mm. and if I'm going to be completely honest, yeah, 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 and I accept that. Yeah. yeah. I hear you, Andy, but Andrew, thank you very much for allowing Street Mike podcast to come and interview you mm -hmm. today. I felt it was, see the birds and they're flying past us, and I felt it was very important to do so mm -hmm. because you have a very important story to tell in regards to what happened to yourself. And like you said, you were... In Golders Green, you were minding your own business. You saw potentially, not potentially, you saw a lady being attacked, being robbed by someone on a motorcycle. You decided to intervene because it brought you back memories of previous situation with your, with your mum. Mm. And you, don't, you said you didn't want to see um, a woman going through that, so you yeah. intervened. Yeah. And you intervened, you did what you had to do, you got the lady's bag back, you gave it back to her, mm -hmm. you went about your business, and when going about your business, what then happened was that you heard someone say, black bastard, and next thing, you didn't know what had actually occurred to you. No. And you had been stabbed four times, did you say? Yeah, four times. You yeah. had been stabbed four times. And then the next thing you know is people are saying, get down, get down, get down. And then the realisation of exactly what had occurred yeah. dawned upon you that someone has thrust a knife into your stomach and you were moments away from death. And you were saying that as you laid on the floor, you can see yourself being called. Yeah. You were being called up to the higher being. You was being called up. Mm. You was being called to heaven. You mentioned about the lights, the darkness, the blackness. And you wanted to go, but then again, you didn't want to go. Yeah, yeah. And you, you also said that the ambulance crews, you said specifically, I think you said 26 or 27 minutes they took to arrive to take you to hospital. And when they eventually took you to hospital, you were saved by the intervention by so many brilliant medical staff. At which hospital was it again? St Mary's Trauma Ward. At St Mary's yes. Trauma Ward. And if it wasn't for them... I wouldn't be here today. You wouldn't be here today. But in closing, Andrew, is there anything you would like to say to those brilliant medical staff at... St. Mary's. Is there anything you want to say to them specifically? Thank you for 
cleaning me up for the strength you gave me. Even on leaving, you arranged some clothing for me, gave you some money, and I say thank you. This amazing story is now available on all the major podcast platforms, including Buzzsprout, iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, TuneIn, and all your favorite platforms. Please contact Wendell Daniel if you have an idea for future episode. I'm now on Twitter at StreetMikePod, or on Instagram at StreetMikePodcasts, or you can send me an email at streetnightpodcast at gmail.com. Please remember to subscribe to this podcast and you will be sure to receive any more interesting conversations from the streets of London.